a little bit about me. I live just up the road here in Santa Rosa and um, have spent the majority of my life in California, both northern, northern and southern. And uh, my co-founder, Aaron, has also grown up here and had a lot of family affected uh, in paradise during the 2018 campfire. And we, when we started Wooey uh, just over two years ago, um, it was to really have an impact at scale here in our communities. So we're a bootstrap startup with a team of 16 that makes software for property owners and insurers and communities to assess and reduce wildfire risk. And I'm gonna pick up a little bit where some of the other speakers that we've heard from uh, have, have left off. We heard from Alistair Watt at IBHS about the uh, IBHS Wildfire Prepared Home Program that offers the promise of insurance availability with potential discounts for mitigation. And we heard from Carleon Safford with Permit Sonoma here who's leading a, a first in the nation effort from the public sector to raise awareness and offer rebates to those who want to reduce their wildfire risk. And one of the biggest challenges we have is overcoming despair and raising awareness about the importance of structure hardening and defensible space, which is something everyone in this room can do and as you go back to your communities and, and engage. And in fact, catastrophe modelers estimate that hardening homes and defensible space can reduce the risk of destruction in a wildfire by 75%. So people can take action and have an impact. And in our experience, it doesn't have to break the bank. Most homes can achieve the base level of wildfire prepared home standard for less than $20,000. But as we know, there's a wide range of homes out there and identifying the risk factors and how to address them for each structure is a pretty complex task. On the left here is a diagram from the National Institutes of Standards and Technology that shows the role that fences and sheds play in spreading a wildfire through a neighborhood. And on the right is a real eyesore of a chart, but it was a great study done by Yana Valakovic and Dr. Steve Quarles, who's an advisor of ours, that shows the greatest predictors of a home burning in a wildfire. And in Paradise, California, only 6% of homes that were within 50 feet of another home that burned survived. So it speaks to why our work here is so important. Because like air pollution, we have a collective action problem and need to get everyone in our communities on board if we're going to reduce our own risk. But people shouldn't have to stay up late at night reading 300 pages of a NIST report to be able to do this on their own properties. So that's what we're working on here at WUI. We make software that uses AI to analyze aerial and on the ground imagery to assess wildfire risk at the community and property level and provide property owners with a custom mitigation plan for getting their home to a place where they can see, sleep soundly at night. Now there's a lot of companies out there selling models that predict where wildfires are most likely to happen. But as we've seen in the Marshall Fire, which happened on New Year's Eve, and in Lahaina, a wildfire can happen anywhere. Someone whose name I'm forgetting said that the wildland urban interface is not a location. It's a set of conditions that can happen almost anywhere in North America under the right, right weather and fuel. And so we recognize that if a wildfire can happen almost anywhere, it's more important to understand how fire can spread throughout the neighborhood and across the landscape at the community and property level. And take into account also the condition of the vegetation and the structures that it might meet along the way. So are those trims, trees limbed up six feet? Are there how many embers would a home be exposed to from a nearby structure? How much radiant heat would it be exposed to? And is that home's condition upgraded so that it has the right vents and siding and no attached combustible fences? This enables us to identify where the lower risk homes and communities are so that insurers can confidently offer policies. So that's what we can do using remote data. We also offer our software to community wildfire organizations and government agencies to conduct assessments at scale. Our app uses all the information needed to identify the wildfire risk factors on a property and automates the process of determining whether it meets code or an insurer's requirements. But we need to know that to scale and to do this with high quality, we need to ensure consistency and objectivity to minimize mistakes. 
And if we're going to make it simple for a property owner to get work done, we need to get accurate measurements too. So we've developed AI to help. When someone takes uh, an image, the app starts looking at what's in it. And in the background, the phone can find relevant features like a wood fence connected to the home. It isolates the feature from its surroundings and then uses the camera's built-in capabilities to place the fence in its environment. And it allows us to measure the fence without a homeowner or contractor having to get out their tape measure. And it enables us to create spatial relationships between features. So we can do the first cut using just aerial imagery, but when paired with on-the-ground images, we can get a comprehensive understanding of a structure's risk factors. And within minutes, we can generate a custom wildfire remodel plan that a homeowner can use to either do it themselves, access incentives, or get help from a vetted contractor network. They can submit photos to document that they've corrected code violations or are ready to get designated under the IVHS program. And when entire neighborhoods take action, we can reduce the chances of a wildfire from turning into an urban conflagration like we've seen too often in the past six years. And in the spirit of cooperation, we've open sourced our data model for describing the features of defensible space and home hardening. And we're not giving people's data away, but we're enabling property owner to take the risk assessment that they get done from a nonprofit agency or a fire agency and carry that to their contractor, to an insurer, and they don't need to get three different inspections in order to qualify under each person's different regulatory programs. And when it comes to studying the wildfire risk factors, imagine the value to researchers if we had millions of records that all use the same data dictionary to describe those things and what learnings we could get out of there that will help insurers also continue to have confidence in underwriting our, our communities. And by standardizing what data is collected, the market can compete on how the data is collected, which lowers the cost and stretches our limited resources. And it can all be done while maintaining data privacy and putting the consumer at the heart. So our vision is to mitigate millions of properties in the next five years so our communities can adapt to wildfire and find affordable insurance. And we look forward to supporting all the programs and initiatives that everyone here has shared over the past three days. So thank you so much and look forward to working together. Hi, that, this is really cool. Um, I'm, as always, taking tons of notes. But one thing I keep, one thought I keep having throughout all of this, through the whole conference um, when we're talking about preparedness and mitigation, is is anybody using the Map Your Neighborhood model? This is a perfect example of where that could apply in terms of neighborhood organization, preparedness, and even work crews to help each other do mitigation. Um, but I have seen lots of, examples where it could also fit. So I just wanted to bring that up if that was a thought. Yeah, I think that's a great initiative. Um, within Sonoma County, maybe some of the folks here from Fire Safe Sonoma know better, but I'm aware of Sebastopol. Is there anyone else outside of Sebastopol in our county that's doing the map, map your neighborhood? Right there in my neighborhood, which is behind that middle school some of you passed, um, we're doing it there. So great. like f four minutes from here, yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. But sometimes getting people to participate is rough, even, especially if they're wildfire professionals who don't have a lot of time. Yeah. That's a full confession. Yeah. Like not. Yeah. yeah. Not naming names. No. Uh -uh. Outing myself, though, 100%. They keep trying to draw me in. I'm like... I'm just, uh, you know, I am, I am wildfire preparing my home, though. So nobody drive by it, though, right now. I, I haven't done that, that front yard piece of it yet. So almost there, though. Yeah. So do you want to talk about more about your work, um, you know, integrating, using your, um, your work with what we're doing here in Sonoma County? Do you want to expand on that at all? Anything like off script you want to go? Sure. Okay. So Yes, uh, we were fortunate enough to be chosen by uh, Sonoma County, so we're supporting Carly Owen Safford and 
the county's program to deploy some of the FEMA grants. And so we have boots on the ground doing these assessments um, day in, day out right now and engaging with property owners to have that conversation, to educate them and to build these plans so that when it comes time to take advantage of the rebates, they've got a list of things that they can uh, do with that. And so that's another service that we offer to other communities who would like help is starting up their own programs, uh, deploying a FEMA grant that they may have received. And that can include everything from doing boots on the ground to training or other uh, software services. And it's going well, <laughs> I guess I should say. Um, we are just about to wrap up phase one of that. We will be doing about 2,500 uh, risk assessments for them. And um, next phase next year will be to deploy the grants up to $10,000 per property. Yes, and I saw actually an inspector when I was out on a walk last Saturday and so stopped him for SoCo Adapts. It's pretty cool. I'm not really sure why there has to be a 75-25% match, though. So you you probably don't know the answer to that, but I'm going to find out. So I think that's a FEMA requirement. It is, but it doesn't have to be, though. FEMA waives oh. that. So um, I know, I'm not going to look at <laughs> Heather to speak for FEMA. Um, but FEMA waves that all of the time, and if they're waving it in, it's one of the questions I have actually have for Julie, is if they're waving it in wind and rain, why are we doing it in um, for wildfire mitigation? Because that doesn't really make sense to me. When we had our mega fire here, because just the cleanup was like $1.2 billion, just, just the debris removal, we had to get, we were the first really out the gate to get a 90-10 split from FEMA, which is now very standard for a debris removal because it's so expensive. So I know that there's room in there. That's all. Fun facts from Learning Jen. everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Any other questions for Ivan? Yeah, I was just wondering if there are requirements for Zone Zero or how you're um, building that in. Yeah, so with Zone Zero requirements, we discussed with Permit Sonoma um, for their program anyway. And for the most part, it's matching IBHS and the wildfire prepared home requirements to not have anything combustible in that area. There's still some discussion happening with maybe mature trees that might be up in that, um, uh, up in the zone zero. So that's, that's the real challenge that I think we have, <clears throat> particularly in Sonoma County, where so many of our communities are in the forest in the redwoods, there's no way that we're going to be able to trim every branch uh, above a structure. Here in Sonoma County, about 80% of our land are, is privately owned. And then the rest of it's mostly owned by the county. We have about 58 regional parks. Um, include, and then that doesn't even include all the land trusts. So, and green belts and everything else. So it's a different animal from like Plumas County or Plumas County, when you go, drive into Greenville, sits um, right in between um, national forests. And so it's, it's a very different sort of animal. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Well, thank you. So thank much. you.